welcome to edurev welcome students i'm claris pereira colasso and i have been training neat medical aspirants in botany and zoology as well as ncert based board exams for the past 8 years we have already completed four parts in reproduction in organisms and we have completed up to the first two events in sexual reproduction today we will be continuing with the last part in reproduction in organisms so let's continue with the events in sexual reproduction so we have finished pre fertilization we have completed fertilization and today we are focusing on post fertilization events now what are the various post fertilization events the first is zygote formation so in fertilization we brought the gametes together now we have the formation of the zygote and finally embryogenesis so converting that particular zygote into an embryo through a whole lot of processes now let's do each of these parts in them the first is zygote formation now we are aware that gametes have to be haploid however when these haploid gametes fuse together you will result in a zygote that is diploid and remember zygote formation can either be external or it can be internal we have already gone through that in the previous video but our question is this if a zygote is diploid however the adult that it must form is haploid then a whole lot of other processes are probably required so let's try to study a little bit about the development of zygotes so for the development of a zygote depends upon two characteristics or rather two features the first what is the life cycle of that particular organism and the second what type of environment is it exposed to now let's go through the first part as in what is the life cycle of the organism now in your class 11 i'm quite sure you have studied uh, some amount of life cycle patterns for example certain organisms can be haplontic in their life cycle which means majority of their life they are haploids or the adult in a way is a haploid the second is a diplontic life cycle in which the adult is a diploid and haplodiplontic life cycle implying some part of its life is haploid phase some part of its life is diploid phase so let's study uh, zygote formation in each of these three life cycle patterns the first is life cycle in organisms that show haplontic lives so haplontic life cycles imply a majority of their life or the adult organism is a haploid for example fungus Now here you can see whatever is given to you in pink is the haploid part of the life cycle in blue which is a very small portion is the diploid part of the life cycle now the adult in this particular organism is going to be called as the gametophyte and from the figure you can observe that the gametophyte has to be haploid in nature indicating haplontic life cycle now if such a gametophyte must form its gametes gametogenesis the gamete and the parent body are both haploid which means you should have mitosis occurring over here so we have discussed this particular concept in the fourth video lecture so can we go through that for further understanding now once these haploid gametes have been formed they will fuse together syngamy must occur to give you a diploid zygote but the problem now with the diploid zygote is the diploid zygote must give me a haploid adult how is that possible only in one way this particular diploid zygote must undergo meiosis so diploid getting uh, converted into haploid spores through reductional division so this would ensure that a diploid zygote is converted into a haploid adult so meiosis is required here haplontic life cycles are common in lower plants as well as in case of fungi next coming to diplontic life cycle so those organisms that show a diploid phase for example human beings or uh, gymnosperms and angiosperms we are diplontic life cycles okay so majority of your life cycle is diploid and a small portion is haploid here the adult is going to be called as sporophyte very different from the previous case which is a gametophyte and the sporophyte is considered to be diploid you can observe that in the figure now this particular sporophyte when it undergoes gametogenesis diploid sporophyte giving rise to haploid gametes very clearly you require reductional division so meiosis is involved in gametogenesis these haploid gametes must fuse together that syngamy to give rise to a zygote and the zygote will be diploid which is quite good for us because the adult is diploid zygote is also diploid so the only way or the only division that you require henceforth
the only division that you require henceforth is the conversion of that particular zygote into a sporophyte which is very very easy simply undergo a whole number of mitotic division so mitosis is required here to form the adult body let's move on the next is if you have a haplodiplontic life cycle so a haploid phase as well as a diploid phase now in this particular case you will have to merge the previous two understandings so we will not focus too much on uh, haplodiplontic life cycle examples here bryophyta and pteridophyta now we said development of a zygote depends on number one the life cycles so we've already gone through the life cycles but it also depends on the environment that you are exposed to so what about the environment Let's take for example uh, algae or fungi. Now very often you will see that part of their natural cycle, so because they are an aquatic medium in algae and sometimes because of unfavorable conditions you will see uh, thick walled spores being formed in this particular case. So the environment enforcing the presence of thick walls around the spores okay, to protect the developing cycle. So this is how the environment plays a role. Now, we said that post-fertilization events are number one, zygote formation, followed by embryogenesis. So let's look at embryogenesis. Now embryogenesis is very simply the conversion of a zygote into the embryo, which means in other words, growth and development. Now, embryogenesis actually involves two parts or rather two, uh, two different characteristics. The first is cell division followed by cell differentiation. Now, what do we imply by both these two? For example, Cell division would imply increase the number of cells of that particular zygote while forming an embryo. But what does cell differentiation mean? Cell differentiation means cause differences between cells. Now why is that required? Imagine that if in a human, uh, let's say in the female body you have a zygote and you simply increase cell numbers. It has no meaning. Some of those cells must form say cardiac tissue, others must form bone tissue, others must form maybe say the nervous tissue. So therefore differentiation is required. So cell differentiation makes sure that cells are modified into various tissues and into various organs. So that's how you get a complete organism. So embryogenesis must involve cell division as well as cell differentiation side by side. So we are going to study embryogenesis in case of animals and embryogenesis in case of plants. So starting with animals. Now development of zygotes can take place in two ways oviparous or viviparous. Now what is the meaning of the word oviparous? Oviparous means it takes place outside the female body. Viviparous means development of the zygote takes place within the female body. Now let's understand oviparous first. Oviparous implies development outside the female body irrespective of the location of fertilization. For example, in case of frogs you have external fertilization but you will also have external development. But in case of let's say the hen, chicken, fowl, you will have internal fertilization followed by external development. Both these two conditions are oviparous conditions. But in case of a human being, we are viviparous. Internal fertilization followed by internal development within the female. So let's look at some of the characteristics of oviparous first. Let's take the example of fowl, that is chicken, hen. Okay. So development takes place outside the female body. The zygote must be placed in a hard calcareous shell, so we are aware of that, in a hard shell. And obviously the hen is going to lay that egg in a very safe environment. Finally, the hen must incubate the egg during which the embryo will de develop into the young chick inside the egg. Okay, So after a period of incubation, the young one will definitely hatch out. Now coming to viviparous development. Viviparous development takes place within the body of the female. So take for example a human being. Internal fertilization followed by internal development. Now, in this particular case, the mother would house that young one for maybe say nine months. So after a particular period of growth, the young one is delivered out. So after nine months, the mother would deliver the child. Okay, And definitely during the period of incubation within the body, you have proper embryonic care, proper protection. So the uterus, the placenta, you have enough amount of nutrients moving in, enough amount of protection coming in. Okay, so these are the characteristics of viviparous development. Now, let's move on to embryogenesis in plants. For that, let us have a look at the different worlds of a plant. The first are the sepals giving rise to the calyx, that's the first world. The second are petals giving rise to the corolla. The third is the stamen, which in other words is the androsium consisting of the anther and filament. And finally, you have the carpal, actually speaking the pistil, which consists of the stigma, the style and the ovary. 
okay now in a plant always fertilization is going to be internal because the the pollen grain falls on onto the stigma pollen tube is generated and causes fertilization inside the ovary okay the egg is inside the ovary so you will always have internal fertilization and always internal development now amongst all these whorls only one whorl is important for us the female part so the couple will persist however the other whorls will fall off they will wither and fall so the only important whorl for us is the couple in terms of embryogenesis in plants now we need to study certain parts of flowers and what are the corresponding parts in the fruit after fertilization for example the egg in the flower before fertilization once it is fertilized gives rise to the zygote the egg exists inside the ovule so the ovule is the outer covering so in the fruit or rather after fertilization the outer covering will form the seed which makes perfect sense the moment you sow the seed in the soil and it germinates the zygote gives rise to the radical and the plumule which means the young plantlet eventually next third the ovary so the ovule is present in the ovary so the ovary becomes the swollen fruit in some particular cases okay so we need to study this particular part very very well it's very important for your neat exam now let's go through a couple of mcqs the first which among the following statements is incorrect gametogenesis and gamete transfer are pre fertilization events that's a true statement life span of an organism usually includes juvenile maturity and senescent stages also true maturity would mean reproduction endosperm provides food to the seed i'm not really sure so let's leave that aside option d in flowering plants the zygote is formed inside the ovule of the female sex organ true so let's go to option c endosperm provides food to the seed now that's wrong endosperm provides food to the zygote which is present in the seed so it is the zygote that develops into the embryo okay so the answer here is option c let's move on which of the following is incorrect statement with respect to transfer of gametes first transfer of male gamete is an essential event in sexual reproduction that's true second transfer of gamete is relatively easy in a bisexual organism also true for example consider a bisexual flower very easy to move pollen grain from the anther to the stigma of the very same flower next in unisexual organisms it occurs by copulation or simultaneous release that's perfectly fine frogs simultaneous release humans copulation option d in lower plants a special process called pollination ensures transfer of pollen grains now this is wrong simply because lower plants don't have pollen grains okay so there is no question of pollination so the answer here is option d the next the third question they, these are two statements related to sexual reproduction so you're going to choose which is correct and incorrect let's go through them in both plants and animals hormones are responsible for transition between the three phases that is a correct statement next interaction between hormones and certain environmental factors regulates reproductive processes as well as associated behaviors uh, behavioral expressions in organisms now that is also true so therefore the answer here is option a so students i hope you have enjoyed the five lectures on reproduction in organisms and i'm quite sure by going through them you will be well versed in this particular topic uh, kindly go through the other lectures Uh, notes and tests that are present in EduRev Infinity, and I'm quite sure if you go through this, you will increase your nationwide ranking and do really well in your NEET exam. Thank you, students.